I'm Kim Bosick with Eye on Sun Valley. You know, a lot of people who drive out to the Proctor Mountain Loop to go hiking think this is the old Proctor Mountain chairlift. It's not. It's the Rood Mountain chairlift, and it has quite a fascinating history at Sun Valley. Fortunately, we at Eye on Sun Valley have a wonderful historian, John Lundeen, who can tell us all about it. Let's find out more. John Lundeen is a lawyer turned historian. He just published a new book, Sun Valley, Ketchum, and the Wood River Valley, everything you need to know about the history of this area. John, tell me a little bit about what we have behind us. Karen, we're standing here on Rood Mountain. That's spelled R-U-U-D. It is named after Sigmund Rood, a very famous Norwegian ski jumper who in 19, spring of 1937, along with Alf Engen, located and designed a ski jump uh, for Ivro Harriman, because when Sun Valley opened, it did not have a ski jump. And Harriman needed that to make Sun Valley the center of uh, ski recreation and ski jumping in the country. Uh -huh. So Sigmund and Alf uh, scouted the areas, located this, and designed a ski jump that used the natural terrain of the hill. And they felt this was one of the most perfect places you could find given the natural terrain. You can't see it now, but uh, they actually had a ski jump on the hill, again, using the natural terrain of the hill. But what you see behind me is a ski lift that was built in summer of 1937. And if you look further up in the hill, you can see a large wooden contraption. Mm -hmm. That was where the judges stood to jump the ski jump, to judge the ski jumping wow. that took place immediately by them. Now, Rude Mountain was designed to do two things. Number one, it was a ski jumping center. And number two, it was where the slalom races were held after 1937. And the ski, the ski lift was designed to handle both events. If you're going to ski jump, you would get off the, the chairlift halfway up the hill on that wooden ramp and then ski over to the top to the in run of the ski jump. If you're going to slalom race, you would go all the way to the top of the hill and get off there and then you'd have the whole rude mountain to ski on. Mm -hmm. And keep in mind, this is 1937. They actually used this in 1938 for the first time. There were virtually no ski lifts anywhere in the country and Sun Valley was revolutionary in the fact that it had the first chairlift that we, as we know, was just invented by Union Pacific engineers. Now I've seen pictures of spectators stands down here. This actually was more popular than regular skiing at one time from what I understand. Does this date back to Norway? Uh, it certainly does, but let me talk about your uh, question about the spectators. Sun Valley actually set up grandstands down here so the spectators could sit down and enjoy both the ski jumping and the slalom contest. And in a, when Sun Valley held four-way competitions that involved downhill, slalom, cross-country, and jumping, the cross-country routes usually went out Trail Creek and came back here. So you could sit in the grandstand and watch three of the four events right here in Comfort. Now your question about the origins of ski jumping, you're absolutely right. Ski jumping is a Nordic sport and particularly a Norwegian sport. Uh, and in Norway, ski jumping is really just a form of normal skiing. They don't differentiate as much as we do. In Norway, most uh, children traditionally start jumping at age three or four on small jumps that their fathers make in their backyard or on their farm. Many Norwegian children traditionally skied to school and they, on downhill areas, they built jumps so they could practice on the way to school and on the way home. So it was really part of their culture. Uh, they started having distance and form contests in Norway in the early 1800s and it really became sophisticated and uh, very competitive in the latter half of the 1800s. And the classic jumping event in Norway is called the Holenkollen. And Holenkollen is uh, on the outskirts of Oslo. 
and that is the National Championship of Norway. And the person who wins the Holand Coleman is the national champion of Norway and was considered in the 30s and 40s as a champion of the world. It was such a great event. John, how did ski jumping come to the United States? Well, Karen, it came with the Norwegian immigrants. And there was a flood of Scandinavian and Norwegian immigrants in the latter half of the 1800s for a variety of reasons, including economics. Uh, the United States offered uh, a grand new vision of freedom and uh, a chance to earn a living in ways that related to their, uh, their occupations in Norway, but the opportunities were far greater here. So the Norwegian immigrants, starting in the latter half of the 1800s, flooded into our country, settling mostly along the northern tier of the United States, New England, the Midwest, and the Pacific Northwest. And uh, they brought along with them their traditional sport of ski jumping. And it was part of their cultural pride and a way to maintain cultural ties with themselves and a way to show their new country what uh, a sport they're very proud of. Uh, in fact, there's a saying, when two or three Norwegians get together, they build a G ski jump and have a competition. And uh, it was such a part of their culture. So ski jumping began earliest in this country in the Middle West, and it spread like wildflower. <laughs> they, um, you don't need a large hill to build a ski jump, like an alpine uh, competition. Any small hill with good snow and a steep pitch, you can build a ski jump, and that's what they did. As a matter of fact, in Michigan, by the end of the 1890s, there are 30 different ski jumping uh, clubs that held competitions. And that was true all over the country. In the Pacific Northwest, ski jumping started in 1913 in Spokane, and in 1916 in downtown Seattle. We had our first ski jumping exhibition uh, in early February 1916 after a record-setting snow paralyzed the city. And our Norwegian businessmen decided to hold an exhibition there to show off their sport. And it was a fabulous hit. Everyone loved it. They then decided to formalize competition. And from 1917 to 1924, a ski jumping tournament was held on Mount Rainier over the 4th of July. And it was said to be only the second place in the world you could hold a summer ski jumping tournament outside of Finsen, Norway. That only lasted till 24, but then ski jumping started in earnest in Kleelum, which is east of Snoqualmie Pass. And in 1929, there's a surge of activity as new, other new ski jumping organizations started. The Seattle Ski Club on Snoqualmie Pass, the Leavenworth Ski Club in, uh, on the east side of Stevens Pass, and the Cascade Ski Club in Portland on Mount Hood. And they all built their own ski jumping arenas and jumps and had competition. And there was a circuit started in Washington that where they would go on successive weekends sometimes and compete in, the, uh, in different forums. And that was joined in 1938 by the Milwaukee Ski Bowl that built probably the big, one of the biggest jumps in the world there for the four-way competition we held in Washington in 1940. I know you can't wait to hear more, but we have to take a break. We'll be right back. Better food, better price, better service. Atkinson's Market, supporting local farmers since 1956. InterHealth MD is family medicine like it used to be. Affordable, personal, and looking to the future. Let the event dazzle your guests by creating a sensational experience. Let the event take your party over the top. Hi, I'm Karen Bostic with Eye on Sun Valley. We're back with John Lundin who has authored many books about ski jumping and Sun Valley history. So John, how did ski jumping find its way to Sun Valley? Well, Karen, uh, the story is pretty well known that uh, Avery Harriman, who was chairman of the board of Union Pacific Railroad, had to face the effects of the Great Depression on his railroad. And the biggest thing that was hit was passenger travel. So he came up with 
a program to reintroduce and re-stimulate passenger travel. The first thing Harriman did was invest into a new form of locomotives and engines and cars called streamliners. They were light, made of aluminum, diesel-powered, comfortable, air-conditioned, and very fast. And then once he got those in operation, he needed a place for the passengers to go. And since he was an international banker and realized that many of his friends in Europe, his banking friends, spent two or three weeks every winter in the mountains, he thought that would be the perfect solution uh, for Union Pacific. And he, he decided to build a ski jump, excuse me, a ski area in the western part of the United States on an area that was served by Union Pacific Railroad. So again, it's a well-known story. He had his friend Count Felix Schafgatz, an Austrian count, come over here. And the count searched for the best location in the Western United States. He went through six states in six weeks, looked at virtually every place that later became a ski area, and rejected all of them for some reason. Finally, almost as an afterthought, he was shown Ketchum. And it, Ketchum had the advantage that it was the, uh, had the most snow and it cost the most to remove the snow for Union Pacific than any other of his lines except for Yellowstone. So when the count came in here, he immediately said, this is the perfect place. That's the right combination of snow, weather, and hills. And he wired Harriman saying, this is the best place for a ski area I've ever found, including looking at Switzerland and Austria. So the rest is history. Um, Harriman bought the Brass Ranch, and by December 1936, they had the Sun Valley Lodge ready for opening, and they were skiing in the winter of 1937 here, the first year. Now, the first year, there were only two mountains open for skiing, and both had chairlifts that were a terrific innovation. Keep in mind that skiing was a fledgling support in those, uh, it was sport in those days. Uh, there were only a few places that even had rope toes, and most skiers did what we call backcountry skiing, putting skins on and climbing the hills to ski down. So the thought of riding a chairlift to the top of the hill was extraordinary. Uh, he built a modern lodge with basically New York City conveniences. You could even have a butler and maid there uh, if you needed it for, to maintain your lifestyle. Uh, he started a uh, ski school with Austrian instructors that made skiing sexy. And uh, this became known as the San Moritz of Europe, and it was a cultural phenomenon. However, the one, thing, uh, one additional thing he did is that he set out to make Sun Valley the center of skiing and ski competition in the United States. And he held annual races here that were ultimately renamed the Harriman Cup and they brought the best competitors in the world here to, to ski and race. Uh, competitors came from all over the country and all over Europe, and it was said that they became so famous that just like every tennis player wants to play at Wimbledon, every skier wants to race in the Harriman Cup. So the first year they had uh, a scheduled competition was spring of 1937, and they ran the slalom on dollar. And keep in mind that uh, there was initially no lift up Bald Mountain, because in 1936, Bald Mountain was see, uh, seen as being far too advanced and far too difficult for most skiers. Uh, we didn't get uh, lift serve skiing up there until the winter of 1940, although it, many people who were advanced skiers skinned up there to, to ski down. So the first Harriman Cup in uh, spring of 1937 with a, was a huge hit. And there's one, as most of us know, by Dick Durrance, the famous Dartmouth uh, skier. And Harriman realized that as good an event it, as it was, he was lacking one major thing, and that is a ski jump. Because in those days, there were really very few specialists in skiing. Uh, virtually all of the prime competitors were four-way skiers. And there were four-way competitions that involved downhill, slalom, cross-country, and jumping. And since Harriman wanted his new ski resort to be the center of ski recreation and ski competition, 
he needed a ski jump. So after the Herman Cup in 1937, he talked to two very famous Norwegian ski jumpers who had been in the country for a while, Sigmund Rud and Alf Engen. And they'd known each other for a long time because both immigrated into the United States in 1929 and they were part of a professional ski jumping organization that lasted for about five years. Both of them extremely successful. He asked them to locate a place for a ski jump and a slalom competition because the slalom course on Dollar Mountain was pretty limited. So they found the mountain that we're standing in front of and you can see behind us. And they determined it had the perfect pitch for a ski jumping hill and very little had to be done to modify the hill to make a jump. And Harriman uh, decided, gave the go-ahead. He appropriated twelve to $14,000 to build a ski jump and a lift. And they looked at various different sizes of a ski jump to build. They ultimately decided on a 40-meter jump, which is 131 feet. Uh, that's how meters convert. And that really is, in the competitive world, a very small jump. If he intended to make this a, a center of ski jumping, he would have built a 70, 80, or 90 meter jump. Uh, but this jump was designed really for four-way competition more than anything. And that's how it was used, basically. The, the, there's a very interesting story about the chairlift you see behind us. This started out as a J-bar, or a drag lift, and it was used to take people from very near the lodge to the base of the Proctor Mountain Lift in the winter of 1937, and it never worked very well. So rather than build a new system, they decided to disassemble that, convert it from a J-bar to a chair, and, and install it right here. So John, why did ski jumping end? When did it end? Well, ski jumping continued through the 1940s, and it was extremely popular. The war interrupted everything, and Sun Valley didn't really uh, didn't reopen until December 47. Uh, but the Harriman Cup competition started. But ski jumping after the war never had the luster that uh, it had before the war. Alpine skiing grew in population, uh, the number of people doing it, and the excitement of the events. The big event was the 1948 Olympics, where the Alpine team was selected in Sun Valley and trained in Sun Valley in 47 and 48. So John, where can people learn more about this? Well, Karen, I have three books that between now and January are coming on the market. The first is Sun Valley, Ketchum, and Wood River Valley that has some great historic pictures of ski jumping on Rood. In, on November 7th, my classic uh, history book about Sun Valley called Skiing Sun Valley, a history from Union Pacific to the Holdings, has extensive coverage and discussion of Rood Mountain. In January of 2021, my third book called Ski, uh, Ski Jumping in Washington, a Nordic Tradition we published, and that discusses the extensive history of ski jumping in Washington, but also includes jumping in the surrounding areas, okay. including Sun Valley. Okay, all right. Well, thank you, John. I hope you learned a lot about this fascinating little slice of Sun Valley history. Until next time, I'm Karen Bosick with Eye on Sun Valley, and I'm keeping my eye on Sun Valley for you. <laughs>